I'm Michelle Carnley. I'm out here at Papa Rocco's with the very legendary Cliff Darby. How you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Michelle. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Since the last time we talked to you, you've moved to Nashville. Tell us a little bit about uh, being up there and what's going on. Well, I lived in Nashville back in the late 80s. I had a record deal and, and toured and played the Opry and did some other things. But this time I moved back with a new ambition. As a songwriter, I'm there primarily to get cuts, uh, write with other songwriters, which I've been doing. Been there for about a month and a half now, and every week something brand new has happened. I've just signed a major uh, management deal with a company. We're planning a tour to Japan in August. Um, and I'm recording with a, a signed label group right now who's doing my album, and they're playing and backing me all up on it, and it's going to be a great album due out probably in April. So it's going to be a great album. All my new songs I've been writing, and it's just been a real great experience. Everything has just been going my way. I've just really been blessed. Well, I yeah. lived in Nashville for a few years. I was on uh, Mickey Gilley's label, and uh, Charlie Pride was one of my label mates there. And uh, I had a song that was uh, picked up by the Homeless Coalition, uh, Barbara Bush founded it at the time, and it was called Michael's Christmas Prayer, and uh, I was invited to play the Grand Ole Opry, and did pretty good, and they really liked what I did, and they invited me back for a return, and that's when I performed one of the songs that's on my new album, it's called The Paper Boy, and I uh, had multiple encores for that, I was Bill Anderson's guest for that particular um, thing, and it was real nice, I enjoyed doing that. Now, uh, since you are back up there in Nashville, and, and amongst the, the Grand Ole Opry up there, do you see yourself playing up there again? Um... I really, if it happens, you know, Michelle, it happens. I'm a little older than I was before, and, and I really just would prefer to get song cuts. That way my time is my time. I can go bass fishing, which I love to do. Um, if, if it happens, that, like I said, this management deal, they've got me opened up for some major acts for the next three months. Uh, we're planning a stateside tour for about, about three and a half, four weeks. And then we're planning to go to Japan. And after that, coming back, they just purchased a theater in, near Branson. And so it'll be every night a country music show, which I'll be a part of. And after that, then we're, they're talking about uh, going to Palo, uh, Brazil, South America. So. How's the uh, community up there, the music community, how are they, how are they accepting you up there? They, they seem to like me pretty good. I, I, I'm having a good time. I've made a lot of friends up there. I've seen some old friends I haven't seen in years. They still are up there plugging away. Uh, but I met a lot of good people, and they've just been real nice and friendly to me. And it's just about it's about making, uh, uh, building good relationships with the people up there, and, and just writing good music. And I've really had some uh, good opportunities to write with some very established writers. Some of them have some major hits, and they're pulling me right under their wings. And uh, I'm doing some good things up there, so I really am glad. Okay, Cliff, as an as an uh, recording artist signed to a Nashville record label in the late '80s, tell us a little bit about where you performed and who you toured with. Well, I, uh, I played with Ricky Van Shelton and Johnny Rodriguez as a regular player. And uh, after the, I moved from Nashville, I had, like I said, a, a record deal. Uh, I got to perform at the Grand Ole Opry several times and uh, cut a couple of records and had a good time. I moved back to Florida and, and uh, in the early 90s and had my own house band. We, uh, we opened for various acts such as Emmy Lou Harris, Dwight Yoakam, Clint Black. Um, every like every two weeks as part of the house band thing so I got to meet a lot of nice people in the business and uh, um, I had a really good time doing that. Where are you from originally? I'm from, I'm from Central Florida around Daytona uh, but I, I've lived in uh, all throughout the south different places uh, Nashville, the, the Carolinas and uh, just been playing music ever since I was a kid. What instrument did you start playing first? The guitar, piano and how old were you when you started? I started playing stand-up bass. Uh, my, my, my parents and my sister and I, we had a, a group that traveled from church to church, and I was eight years old, and I had a three-quarter size bass, a stand-up bass, and I used to have to stand on a big orange crate to do it, but uh, I'd play the ba big bass like that. And then I got into uh, the piano. I took piano lessons for a few years, but I found that I couldn't really take that along with me where I wanted to go, so my father played guitar, and he showed me a couple of chords, and I started playing on that, and then... Throughout high school, I picked up a lot of the uh, the brass instruments and started playing in school band. And uh, you're a professional musician, right? You have the luxury of doing this for a living. You don't really have to have a day job, correct? That's correct. I'm quite blessed. I, I really enjoy what I'm I do. I'm here with Cliff Darby, the grand winner of Sure's third annual Musical Roots songwriting competition. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Doing good. Okay, out of all of your um, all of all of your great original songs, what made you choose the Paper Boy as your entry? Well, it was a musical roots competition. I knew they were, I'd kind of done some research, and uh, the previous winners were from all genres, from alternative to orchestral pop, rock and roll, 
country, blues, swing, you name it. I knew they were looking for something that was just rootsy, and so I'm rootsy, and so that's what I did. Well, tell us about your um, prize package and what it included. They flew us out to uh, California, all accommodations, picked us up in big stretch limos. That was a first for me. And uh, stayed right there at the Hilton Towers, and I performed at the House of Blues that Friday night, opening up for the Reverend Horton Heat. I uh, had an awesome time. Uh, as a result, also won $5,000 in Sure Recording Gear, became a Sure uh, endorser, and uh, uh, made scheduled interviews. And uh, I'll be in the like, Guitar Player Magazine, Sure on Tour, performing songwriter, and some others. It's a real feather in my songwriting hat. Well, that's great. Congratulations to you on this, by the way. Thank you very much. Okay, you mentioned that you played at the world-renowned House of Blues. How was the crowd response to your performance out there? Excellent. It was standing room only. Um, it's um, in California people, they just like different things, as you know, very liberal people. And uh, they, when I started yodeling, they just they brought the house down. It really was a great response. And I had a lot of people come up to me, told me I should have headlined the act. So that made me feel come from miles around here, me little, 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 little. Uh, I made some great connections, uh, some industry contacts, and uh, it's just an open door from here. I'm just so very excited. Uh, um, a really good thing for me. I really am having a good time. talk to you about your recent number one video, The Intimidator. I want to ask you a little bit about the video. Tell me first of all about the song, how you came about writing that. Well, I was watching the, uh, the news after Dale Earnhardt got killed at Daytona and uh, just was really amazed at all the people that came out with the memorials and so forth like that. I was really not a racing fan. I mean, my family's watched it for years, but I was not up to it like some people are into it. But I just got to watch, and it kind of reminded me of when Elvis died. And I just thought it would be really kind of neat to write a song that kind of, like, talked about his life and the things that he'd done in his uh, big career. How quick did it come together? Uh, actually, it, I write a lot of songs, and this, that's, that particular song was, like, the quickest one I've ever written. It's probably about 35, 40 minutes at the most. came to real, real fast for me. Do you have the luxury of jumping straight into a studio with something like that and jumping in the, at the moment, or how did you go about that? Well, for the most part, when I write a song, Mike, I have a little studio at my house, and I do a lot of the demo work there, lay down on a four-track. And uh, my publisher picked it up right away. She's in Nashville, and uh, we decided to go up there and cut it there in a studio. And uh, did that in one weekend, and since then they've been pitching it to uh, various artists such as Hank Jr. and Travis Tritt. Tell me how so, the video right. came about. How long after you recorded the song did you decide to do a video and... How did the concept of the video and the involvement of Five Flags and what have you come into play? Well, uh, I know uh, Phil Thomas has a great uh, show with the videos and so forth like that, and I, I ha had such a demand for the song itself. You know, I, I after I cut the album and put the uh, the Intimidator out as a single, a lot of people approached me about, boy, this would be a great concept for a video, and and uh, you know, being here in Pensacola and uh, with a uh, the Uncharted Zone and the great things that y'all have there, I thought it'd be a, just a neat thing to do, you know, to get a video made. And so I called Phil Thomas Cat, and we just got together, and we put something, a good uh, ideas together, and uh, came up going up to Five Flags Speedway and putting it together. Well, they call him the Intimidator. He's a one of a kind and will never be an imitator. He'll always be the greatest. And his fans will all agree Number three will always be number one to me I know a lot of uh, professional musicians tend to, at times, avoid listening to other music so they can focus on their uh, own material. Do you listen to a lot of music? What are, the, what are the kind of titles that we see in your immediate listening collection right now? Um, I listen primarily to um, groups like... Uh, America, Loggins and Messina, James Taylor, The Beatles, Eagles, uh, a lot of dated stuff uh, because I, that's the era I grew up in. I know that's a lot of uh, folk-oriented type music for a country musician. Uh, how has one influenced the other? Well, it's, it's uh, to me, music is music, you know, but I, I hear a lot of things in the older stuff that can be uh, applied to, uh, to the movements and music that I like to write. Um, on my album, 
um, you'll hear influences from the Beatles, uh, even some um, some blues based stuff and I, I just prefer to write from the things that really uh, touched me the most and th that era of music such as Poco, uh, Little River Band, uh, a lot of those bands uh, really made an influence upon me. Um, my earliest influences were gospel. My family had a gospel traveling group so I started a lot in gospel and played with a uh, Wally Fowler group out of Nashville for a few years and um, then I got more into like you said the folk oriented thing and then uh, uh, then I started getting just into hardcore country and people like Steve Earle and uh, um, Buck Owens and Wynn Stewart uh, were great influences upon me in my musical career.